This episode of the Techzilla is brought to you by Intel's Core i7 processor. Find yours now at mwave.com, the PSP 3000, and the national campaign against drunk driving. Coming up on today's show, we built the mini, the macro, we're building the photo studio. We got some tips on what's coming up in technology next year and the most awesomest musical tribute ever and a lot more. So fire up a Yule log and throw back some eggnog because Texilla starts now. Welcome to Techzilla, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. You are in New York, you flew. What did you do on the plane while you were, what did you, what, what toys did you take on so the plane So even though it you? appears that I'm here in San Francisco at the moment, <laughs> when you're watching this, I'll probably be in New York for You're like for the human Christmas. DVR, shifting know, time. It's creepy, I'm a, I'm a time shifter, I'm some <laughs> kind of alien species. Anyway, um, I, you know, I like to watch Eureka on my iPhone. That's what really? I do when I go on airplanes or when I'm commuting. Have you seen that show? Not even a little bit. Oh, it's so good. It's a show all about this guy that ends up in this mysterious town, and everyone in the town are like super scientists, and they all work at this company called Global Dynamics, and every week something crazy happens, like wormholes or, or time traveling or all sorts of stuff, and there's this one guy, the sheriff, that's, he's normal. He's like, every, he's like, you know, you or me. Well, I mean, other than the fact that we're brilliant, but he's just a normal dude. I'm just joking. But uh, I'm not brilliant. Um, but it's a great show, and I, I downloaded it on iTunes. And you know, as opposed to getting it more nefarious ways, I actually get it on iTunes just because you it's easy. It. I pay for it. Buck ninety nine. I don't get the I don't get the um, HD version. I get the standard def. It's just on the little iPhone. It doesn't make a difference to me. I finished reading Pride and Prejudice on my iPhone what? this weekend. I started it on the the plane coming back from St. Louis. Got mm -hmm. like thirty chapters knocked out. How was that? How was actually, that experience of reading on such a small screen? I've been using Stanza and the screen. And actually, I like it a lot better reading on this than I did on most of the e-paper based readers, like the Sony eBook or the Kindle. Because oh. when they when they do that thing where they go, the entire screen goes black and then everything drops out to make the letters again. I understand. I that. find that excruciating after about fifty. Well, you pages. have to you have to kind of train your brain. To, you know how like with with pixels, mm -hmm. like our brain fills in the gap in pixels to make it be a cohesive image. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to learn how to do that with a Kindle because when you're using it, you you <laughs> almost get to the bottom of the page and then you you hit the page turn button right before you get to the bottom. So, so you're still you're your brain is still processing the rest of the sentence while you're crossing, and then you start over just like you turn the page. I normal. just started closing my eyes when I turned the page. Is that like way too complicated to like <laughs> kind of relearn how to read? something. Well, what I noticed about this, I think it's okay. obviously this isn't going to get like four, it's not a full size page, it's not four million hours of battery life because it's powering the entire screen, it's not the mm -hmm. efficiency of e-paper, but actually I thought it was great because, yeah. you know, I've got Shakespeare and a bunch of my favorite Mark Twain novels in here and Jane Austen and got my Pride and Prejudice on and you're like... I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed that you can manage it because I tried to read on an iPhone also at one point. It didn't work out for me. I Just couldn't, stanza, I couldn't try do stanza. it. All right. Some of the other ones. I'll take your advice because you tend to know what you're talking about. So. Or maybe I'm just a mad fool desperate for the verbiage. <laughs> Bill from Chicago has some really cool smartphone questions. Actually, some really good smartphone questions. Shall we take them on one by one? I think we should. He says, I'm looking to get a smartphone soon. It's probably going to be either a G1 or an iPhone, but I've got concerns. For one, turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Why don't either of these phones have it now? Which phone do you think will have the best version in the future, and will there ever be a turn-by-turn -turn app that works with Google Maps? So this probably has a lot more to do with with uh, licensing and SDKs than it does with the actual hardware. Yeah. I would imagine. I mean, it, it could probably handle turn-by-turn -turn pretty easily. It, it, there, there's no reason in the physical hardware watch shouldn't be able to do turn-by-turn. -turn. And when we, when we say turn-by-turn, -turn, like we know Google Maps, it clicks. You can follow your yourself on like the the uh, iPhone now. We're talking about like turn left in 100 yards. And before Roger starts screaming in mm -hmm. my ear, I gotta say one thing: lots of BlackBerry users can do turn-by-turn -turn directions already. Ready. There is a third type of iPhone that is in not third type of iPhone. <laughs> it's a Freudian slip. Do you know slip. something we don't? <laughs> There's a third type of smartphone out there. <laughs> Everybody's like, it's the G1 versus the iPhone, but the Crackberry, aka the Blackberry, is still an amazing piece of hardware. So 
when we're talking about the G1, I'm not familiar with the SDK, but it's probably going to be a third-party application because the Google Maps terms of service don't let you do real-time nav. The companies that own the data that Google uses, like Navtech, Teleatlas, companies like these, they make buku dollars licensing that data to GPS makers that make the little devices that go up on your dashboard. So, no, not without major changes to licensing will you find turn-by-turn -turn directions inside of Google Maps. Very interestingly though, uh, TomTom has a turn-by-turn -turn app in their development labs for the iPhone, and at least one rumor site says Apple is demoing turn-by-turn -turn apps, uh, but for now, Apple's terms of servants nix the GPS navigation apps, which yeah. is sad face for sure, because Major sad that face. would be so rad if you... I, I'm all about streamlining my right. life, and at this point, I'm trying to knock out as many different gadgets as I can to one device. And so far, <laughs> like as, as much as I almost hate saying it, because I do love having different products and I do love trying different right. things, the iPhone seems to, to become, seems to be becoming that device for me. Yeah, it just covers the spectrum of things that I need right now. And if it had that, it would be even more perfect. It would be even more perfect. More, better, perfect. Which, pla like, which platform is going to have the best one? It depends on if you're asking a G1 or an iPhone owner. Right. I, you ask us in six months when some of the applications actually exist. I mean, the one thing you do have to keep in mind, though, is that a lot of developers are developing for the iPhone in particular just because it has so much of a wider customer yeah. base at the moment. So you're probably going to see more innovation and a little more different apps for your perusal than you might for the G1. Um, although on the other side of the whole thing, it's a lot easier to develop for the G1 because yeah. it is all based in Java. <laughs> so there's a lot more developers that know how to d develop things for Java rather than having to go through the whole iPhone SDK. Yeah, and the Android operating system, which is what the G1 runs, was designed kind of by programmers for programmers and not about creating a precisely controlled environment that is executed by Apple standards. Um, <laughs> Flash browser support was the second part of Bill's question. He wants to watch Hulu.com. Uh, he wants to watch Hulu on his, mm -hmm. on his phone, which everyone gets. Will this ever be possible? Can either phone run an alternative browser that supports Flash like Skyfire? Uh, well, yes. Actually, I believe Opera is already on the G1. And Adobe has a promise that Flash is going to hit the Android OS shortly. Hmm. Now, I don't see why you couldn't run Hulu on a Flash based browser. I haven't had the chance to check it on, I don't have a Windows mobile device phone anymore, but that would be an interesting question whether or not for some reason Hulu would block that. I, I don't think they would. Um, Flash in the iPhone. Yeah, right. We'll see about that. You look so depressed. Yes. <laughs> It's, never think about Flash in the iPhone. That's what happens. That was my one of my first angry complaints about the iPhone was that there was no okay. Flash. So who knows? Maybe eventually, but no Flash, no competitive browsers, no. We've had the competitive discussion before. They don't like things to compete, <laughs> okay. pretty much. Well, but we won't get into that whole thing. I mean, let me fire Bill's third question at you. And there okay. may be at some point another voice dropping from the ceiling in the form of Serafina, who's our one of our producers who is a fervent fan of her G1. Yes. Bill's final question is, what do you guys think are the biggest issues that make iPhone better than G1 or vice versa? That's really going to be up to you at the end of the day. I recommend that you get your hands on both devices and take a look because they are very different phones. I mean, we got this G1. We snuck it from Serafina. And a lot of people like that it has a sliding QWERTY keyboard, which is kind of a big deal. Um, it's not the best QWERTY keyboard I've ever laid my hands on in terms of a phone. But, you know, it works. It's there. Um, and then it also has, obviously, the touch display. But we've talked about this phone pretty at length. I think that episode where, um, <laughs> where Ryan and Josh came on was pretty in-depth on the MacBooks and the G1 that day. But, you know, what I really like about it is that it has a macro focus that can scan UPC barcodes. Maybe that's not a make it or break it feature for everyone. <laughs> um, but I happen to really enjoy scanning barcodes at places. I don't use this as my main phone, but I do have one for testing purposes. And one day at the office, I was pretty much going around to everything with a barcode on it, scanning, 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 <laughs> scanning. Then it would bring up like the, what item it freaking was. And I thought that was so cool. I, now I don't know, know what why. you were doing. Surfing is going to be mad. I didn't even touch your phone that hard. So, yeah. You know, the... the uh, Oh boy, um, more open development environment, so pretty much anything. Yeah, anything. but average Joe doesn't really care about that, do they? Well, do I they? I mean, maybe they do. Maybe well, our viewers do. I know. What they I do, was but. setting up was a statement to point out that this is a more this is a geek phone. It's this a is geek an phone. early adopter is phone. It is a lot of people say it has the applications have an unfinished feel. 
Um, it's extremely slippery. Her feet is like, I'm, yeah, Apparently, a little slipperier than we thought. <laughs> um, it's you know, it's not going to have as many accessories out for it. One of the interesting things about the iPhone, uh, because it's an Apple product and because they're such a hard intense, ridiculously out of control fan base, there's going to be a huge amount of accessories because basically everybody makes tons of accessories for iPhones and iPods because they expect billions of them to be sold. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of gadgetry and cases and stuff around this that probably aren't going to show up for Well, it's the same the thing G1. with the apps. I mean, you're just going to see a lot more support in general for a device that millions upon millions of people own, right? right? But this has the sort of this is still Google kind of a niche friendly market. to developers SDK thing going on. It's all Java-based yes. programming. Well, at the end this of the day, I still say get your hands on both of them and test them out yourself. That's she speaks truth. The do best way to said. do it. <laughs> and then he wants to know, is there a resource or website that compares wireless networks, AT&T versus T-Mobile versus others? Which network do you all think is the best? Well, I think your best resource is probably your friends in the area that are on various networks, so they can tell you how it's been working out for them. Because, I mean, I'm in, we're in San Francisco. Right. We're both on AT&T. And it blows here. It's not nearly. It, Verizon was a lot worse. Verizon doesn't actually work in a three-block area around my house, oh. which is why I had to pay the kill fee to get rid of my Verizon phone a month and a half after I bought it, which was like a month after, a month before I moved there. Um, if you want an iPhone, you're going with AT&T, unless you want to crack it. If you want an Android uh, G1 phone, you're going with T-Mobile, if memory serves. Yep. And yeah, you know what? Talk to people in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, Howard's Forums is great, but nobody knows how stuff works in your neighborhood as much as the people in your neighborhood or town or city. And by the way, if you get like 10 people in a room and you ask them about each network, <laughs> there's going to be like two or three people that have a problem with every single cell phone provider. I do have to say from experience, though, that T-Mobile has some of the best customer service I've ever dealt with of any company ever. So personally, I really enjoy T-Mobile, given had, were the iPhone on T-Mobile by some miracle in heaven, I would probably go with them over AT&T easily. So you don't easily. want to just pay the kill fee and go to the oh. G1? Oh. Uh, I've got one for testing purposes, like I said. So you have one for testing it. purposes? Testing purposes, so when I get sick of it, if I do, I can just give it back. You know, so I can How usually under normal stuff? circumstances, had I known we were going to do this question, I could have brought in that G1 mm -hmm. and talked it about it instead of stealing today. Serafina's. But hey. Well. Next time, Who I'll just... Who knew you had, like, oh, you know several what? Actually, cell phones? Actually, I'm a dummy because it is in my backpack right now. <laughs> Meh. It's time now to thank one of the sponsors of today's show, Intel's Core i7 processor, available at mwave.com. The Core i7 processor features intelligent multi-core technology that kicks into overdrive as your activity becomes more intense. Virtual worlds and environments are rendered seamlessly with physics and AI distribution across eight software threads. That means there's less lag, so the only thing you'll be sacrificing are your enemies, and not your system performance. You'll also experience stunning realism in advanced multi-threaded games as advanced AI, particle systems, dynamic physics, and texture generation engines take advantage of Core i7's power. Plus, shop for a Core i7 processor at mwave.com and use coupon code TEXILA and get 10 bucks off. So if you plan on purchasing a new media tower or gaming PC, look for Intel's Core i7 processor or Processor Extreme. It's a smarter way to take on highly threaded games and applications. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick, a free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week's pick, one of my favorites, Exact Audio Copy. Every audiophile knows that when you're ripping and burning music, you need to start with the best source material possible which means you probably should go buy vinyl, but let's not get into that right now. Exact Audio Copy is a Windows program that grabs audio from CDs and DVDs and then correct errors it finds during processing. If it can't correct the error, then it'll tell you exactly where the problem exists. It's actually a lot slower than the average roofing program, but this is because it's taking its sweet time to make sure that all the data it reads off the disk is as magnificently correct as possible. If you're just looking for a quick and dirty rip, you can speed up the process, but we don't recommend it. It has a lot of features that you'd expect from any other CD copying software, plus options like volume optimization, support for the lame MP3 encoder, local CD-DB, and multi-session support. And if a glitch does make it into the final audio wave, you can manually take it out without opening up a separate audio editor. Exact Audio Copy is free, and it's a work in progress, so you might run into a glitch from time to time, but trust us, it's worth the occasional pain. The developer has some tips and tricks for getting EAC to run the best on your machine, so make sure you check those tips out at exactaudiocopy.de. 
Last week, Veronica had a chance to talk to PCMag.com's Robert Heron about HDTV buying tips for every price range. If you're buying an HDTV, go back the last week and watch it right now. But we also took the opportunity to ask Robert what he felt were the big trends to look out for in 2009. Here's what the man had to say. As the year comes to a close, what do you see as being significant in terms of pricing and technology? Do you see things getting cheaper? Or are they going to kind of you know level out? For things like Blu-ray players, they have to get the price down on that. And throughout the year, we've seen steady declines in, in prices for that. Excuse me. However, with televisions, it seems like they want to try to hold a price point for introducing new models or new features. And they're careful not to introduce too much at once so they can have something fresh for the following year to come to. However, as soon as any TV's been out for even a couple of weeks, you'll, you'll see the price start to decrease over time consistently to a point where it hits a plateau and then it's kind of done until, the, until it's end of life and the model's no longer available. That's a trend that's just consistent throughout time. So if you're really interested in something brand new that just came out, or you're interested in maybe something that just came out right now, wait for that next model to come out and the price on what you're looking at right now is definitely going to drop as long as you don't wait too long. I mean, that's just fairly standard buying advice for that. Is screen technology going to stick with being plasma versus LCD? Is that going to stay the trend? That will. That will for the foreseeable future. They do have the first OLED screen available from San uh, Sony. Hot. The XEL1, the 11-inch beauty. Hot. I mean, it is, it is a world-class display, but it's 11 inches and it's 2500 bucks, and it's, it's one of a kind. That's why it costs that much. Right, and, and rear projection, is that, is that dead, totally, gone the way of the dodo? Totally dead. Uh, they're the last, there's only two companies left making rear projection TVs, maybe three. Uh, they're all getting out of it in the short, in the short term. They really are, are bailing on it quickly for a lot of reasons. I mean, I think one of the last major announcements for this technology will be the laser view from Mitsubishi that's coming out in 65 plus inch screen sizes. The fact that it's using a laser light engine to generate red, blue, and green. A lot of people are interested in it. I've, I've seen it running. It's great, but it's still, it has all the, the inherent characteristics and flaws, really, of RPTV, or, uh, rear projection TV technology, including bad viewing angles, and in generally, you're never going to get absolutely terrific contrast out of that kind of a display system due to internal light scatter, if nothing else. And do you still consider uh, Blu-ray to be the choice to go to for 1080p technology? Oh yeah, uh, without it, there are new forms of 1080p that are now available. I'm seeing the satellite delivery guys now offering 1080p VOD, at least that's available now with my Dish Network service that I use it in the lab. However, I would really like to see the absolute bit rates that they're offering on this content. Again, when you talk about the, the ATSC standard for digital television, as far as HD broadcast goes, they define a total of about, say, 20 megabit for audio and video combined. You go to Blu-ray and you can push it up towards a 50 megabit if you wanted to. Now, and I said 20 megabit for broadcast television, HD, it's rare they ever hit that. And in, in most cases, they try to go far less on that. Now, the advances in new video codecs, particularly with MPEG-4, could make, you know, a half bit rate, a 10 megabit video signal look pretty good at HD resolution. However, nothing beats just having a fire hose of bandwidth available to you with a Blu-ray player. For, for everything from just motion to special effects like fire, anything that's moving in a lot of detail in it, like water rapid or water moving or fire burning, those kind of things are very, or even moving graphics when you see like transitions on your favorite sports games and things like that. Those are very difficult to compress and you, that's where you typically see your breakup and your other just bad gunk on the TV that you don't want to see. Well, that's all great information. Robert, thank you so much for coming in and telling us all about what's coming up in the next year for HDTV. Anytime. Now, if you want to catch more of Robert's work, you can always find it at PCMag.com. And don't forget to catch him on DL.TV every Thursday at noon Pacific. Up next, we got a video question from David Boston, where I hear the weather was actually warmer last week than it was here. That's so weird. Hey, Patrick and Veronica. I think that my roommate, who is a PC user, may have a botnet running on his computer. I was wondering if there are any tools I can use on my Mac to sort of detect this at a network level, what I should be looking for in the various ports, things like that, or should I just tell him to scan his computer? Thanks, guys. Oh, and Veronica, uh, this is for you with love from Boston. It's a Dunkin' Donuts regular coffee. Mm. Just the right amount of cream and sugar. Well, thanks a lot, Dave, for rubbing that in my face. Uh, I really want one of those now. Although technically, since we are in the past future of sorts, I could actually be drinking one right as we're as the people at home are watching this episode. I want a blueberry cake donut or a box of munchkins. Oh, the blueberry ones are so good. Oh man, munchkins! Why is Dunkin' Donuts so awesome? Munchkins. Nothing else is as good. Chocolate oh. donuts. They're open 24 hours. 
Anyhow, Dave, um, if you suspect that your roommate's computer is a zombie, there's only one thing that you can do. <clears throat> Kill it with fire. Yeah, or beat it with a stick, or blow its head off with a shotgun, or... Ooh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm beating the wrong I'm movie. I'm partial to that. Dave, what I want to know, though, because <laughs> I'm, I'm going through the litany of ways to kill zombie computers in my head, or people, but why can't you just walk into his room, fire up his computer, and check it from there? You know, get a copy of Spyware Doctor, and load it up and kill whatever you think's running on there. Why do you need to do it from your Mac? Yeah, that's very. Yeah. I'm very intrigued by this whole process. Like, do they hate each other? Does he not speak to his roommate? Did you steal his Is his, his beer? roommate <laughs> such like a pack rat that the whole or floor is... is just covered in stuff and he can't make it over to? Apparently, he walks like a robot. Make it over to his <laughs> computer to fix the the fix the botnet issue. I mean, but Dave seems like a personable kind of guy. Absolutely. So for those of you who may not know, a botnet is a network of computers under the control of a bot herder, I believe they're called. <laughs> I'd be used with a nerf herder. <laughs> <laughs> it's controlling them to send out spam or, you know, do something like initiate a denial of service attack on another machine. Um, if you notice your computer lagging or what are some of the other signs? Lagging or, <laughs> or like programs running in your task manager that you're not familiar with or, or uh, oh, emails bouncing back that you don't remember sending. You're yeah. like, I don't remember sending that email to Pam. Especially not about before? Viagra. I don't really understand. Yeah. So there's a lot of different signs that you can look for if you're wondering that if your PC is actually a botnet. Um, if your skeevy little brother comes over to browse naughty stuff and installs something that's going to give him free stuff and suddenly your machine's 40% slower, beat him with a stick and then go out and buy something like Spyware Doctor with antivirus. Right. You want to keep your spyware and antivirus all up to date yeah. because primarily they get in by Trojans that you accidentally install. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to jump on your tangent there. No, no. Um, it's good but tangent. yeah, you, I mean, the best medicine is preventative medicine, so definitely yeah. make sure you've got all your, your, your uh, updates. Antivirus and, and spyware. Uh, I'm kind of curious of, is how you might tell from your Mac because you could if you had access to this machine you could set up you know software so you could remote mm -hmm. access and start running applications and nosing around there but I bet what I'm curious for the, all the folks that do the whole IT lifestyle in the audience if you could send us instructions for how you might use a packet sniffer to scan the traffic coming from that machine to see if you can identify a bot infested machine that way and if you if there's a great way to do that email us at revision 3com because I'm very curious about that yeah because he would still need to go and install or at least go give get permissions to get onto his mm -hmm. computer from from his Mac right I mean you yeah. can't just hop on from the network or maybe you can if, Not if really. you're really totally super elite yeah maybe. We, Oh, we forgot one other classic way of getting really foul stuff loaded on your machine. What's that? Downloading software, illegal versions or cracked versions of software yes. off of peer-to-peer -peer sites and installing them on your That's machine. That's true. That's so true. be careful what you download. Run, uh, especially uh, especially if you're doing stuff like that. You shouldn't be and run a decent antivirus and I'm going to take away your, your hand crutch. It's because the, but the, the no, studio, no it's hand for the crutch. studio. No, I don't care. Later, you can have it back when we're done. Anyhow, if you want to get your 15 seconds of internet video fame, send us in a video of your very own. All you need to do is record yourself in front of a camera asking a question, no longer than 15 seconds preferably. Then upload them to YouTube and in email form, send us a link with video question in the subject line. No attachments, please. Let's take a moment to thank one of the sponsors of today's episode of Techzilla, the PSP 3000. If you're hankering for some fun on the go, check out the PSP 3000. Sporting an ultra crisp, super wide display, this portable 3D entertainment system is now available in the Ratchet and Clank Entertainment Pack. This includes the Ratchet and Clank Size Matters game, as well as the National Treasure 2 UMD movie, a PlayStation Network game download voucher for the lovely Echo Chrome puzzle game and a one gigabyte memory stick duo. Of course, with the PSP 3000, you also have access to great games, blockbuster movies, your music and video library, and quite a bit more. So whether you're on a plane, train, or automobile, the PSP 3000 lets you bring the fun and entertainment with you and makes any situation better and more interesting. Please support Techzilla by supporting our sponsors. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, Speech Accent Archive. If you fancy yourself a linguist or just want to appreciate the different types of accents, inflections, and enunciations that people use when they speak the English language, the Speech Accent Archive is your website. A literal library of accents from speakers all over the U.S. and the globe. 
Compare an Aussie accent with someone out in Brisbane or an Eastern Seaboard accent with someone in Staten Island. You'll find endless delight and amusement in the differing speech patterns people use for the exact same words and sentences. Each speaker is listed with a biographical stub listing, among other things, birthplace, native language, age, and where that person learned to speak English, giving you a good understanding of how other languages can influence the enunciation of consonants and vowels. Now, if you want to contribute your own linguistic nugget to the archive, the how-to will give you instructions on how to submit your own speech file to the site. If you want a better appreciation of the English language and the accents that help shape the way it's spoken, then you need to visit the Speech Accent Archive today. So, for example, if you're curious about how someone sounds that was born and raised in Connecticut, then lived in Boston, and now lives in San Francisco for the past five years, well, here you go. Please call Stella. Ask her to bring these things with her from the store. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack for her brother Bob. We also need a small plastic snake and a big toy frog for the kids. She can scoop these things into three red bars. And we will go meet her Wednesday at the train station. As you know, last week, Extreme Tech's Jason Cross was here on set with a holiday video card buyer's guide. And while he was here, he graciously answered a few more questions about what folks should expect to see in the graphics card and processor market next year. Jason Cross is back this week to talk about PC trends in 2009, that year that is coming up soon. Bigger, better, faster, more, right? Yes. We're done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that was so easy. We're out of here. Uh, AMD actually playing catch up with Intel. Are they yes. going to catch up to the i7? Uh, maybe not. Well, they won't catch up in price either. <laughs> no, they'll, so they're they'll more be, expensive, but they're still be, No, they'll be more affordable, that's okay. what I mean. Uh, oh, they won't okay. be as expensive <laughs> as the Core i7s, probably. That's a good uh, thing. So you got Phenom 2 coming out, mm -hmm. which Phenom was their new quad-core architecture this, you know, in 2008 and kind of had its problems. And they've worked out some of those problems, and they're moving to a new manufacturing, the 45 nanometer manufacturing process, and that'll be Phenom 2s probably going to start off being DDR2 only and then supporting DDR3 coming soon early in the year 2009. So that's going to take AMD through 2009. Okay. And they're supposed to be, we haven't seen them yet, we don't know, but they're supposed to be awesome overclockers unlike the, the Phenom was. The Phenom 2s are supposed to be, have a lot of headroom to go That'll crazy. actually be, that'll be big with the enthusiast crowd. Yeah, yes. Well, how about on the graphics card front? On the graphics card front, nobody knows for certain, but DirectX 11 is going to come out around the time of Windows 7, which is probably sometime late 2009. So, and then everyone's got to have graphics cards that support the DX11 stuff, which is cool. <laughs> the cool new stuff there is uh, tessellation and right. compute shaders. Compute shaders is a big deal. What's tessellation? Tessellation is taking a low polygon rough model and breaking it down into a bunch of little polygons to make it smooth, look smooth, and stuff like that. Yeah. And the compute shading? Compute shaders are, it's sort of a subset of DirectX's shading language mm -hmm. to be used for non-graphics things. Oh, really? So kind of like, you know, CUDA, there's OpenCL is another standard coming up soon that Apple is on board with, and coming from the Kronos group, the same people who do OpenGL. So it's using that API to do, you know, physics and video transcoding and image processing and all those other things people do that are not 3D graphics. So finally, like, you'll have a real reason to buy a graphics card to make Photoshop run faster. Yeah, well, I mean, actually, <laughs> Photoshop does, ha CS4 has, mm -hmm. has some features for that right now, but there's no one language. They use OpenGL because all they do is panning and stuff. They don't do all the image processing stuff with that. So th this would give them a, a way to do that in a way that isn't, it's supported equally by all cards. It's, it's going to be one language. It's, it's DirectX. One so, language you with them all and in the darkness find them. Cool. Yeah. So <laughs> you don't have to worry about, well, this is an app that runs, that's CUDA and it only runs on NVIDIA cards and ATI has their ATI stream stuff and it runs on ATI cards and, and finally a language that, you know. Are, are both like NVIDIA and ATI going to play nice and sort of, you know, work with a common language that makes it easy for developers or are they going to keep pushing? It's going to be DirectX 11's compute shader is going to be that language and OpenCL is another one. So, and I don't know which one's going to take off. Obviously DirectX is only going to be on Windows platforms uh, and uh, Apple's on board with the OpenCL thing, so. Are we going to see integrated GPUs in the CPU core, and are integrated GPUs like in the chipset going to suck less in 2009? They're going to suck less, but <laughs> you know, as they get better, also so so do do all the add-in cards right. get better, and the games and everything get more strenuous. So it's their relative performance. I don't really see it changing a whole lot. You know, it, they're still limited by memory bandwidth and stuff. 
So we're going to have, from Intel though, possibly next year, mm -hmm. what's on their roadmap is to build in the integrated graphics into the CPU, possibly not necessarily on the same die, but in the same CPU package. So right. you'll buy a CPU and it's the CPU and the integrated memory controller, which is what they have on the i7, and the graphics core will all be in there. Is that going to be showing up mostly up in netbooks and really small, low-power devices, or? And, and corporate and all those other, all the places that get integrated graphics now, that's, they just won't have integrated graphics on the motherboard. Right. In the Core i7 time frame, it's going to be built into the CPU package. So there was more space in mini ITX boards. <laughs> Yeah, that too. I'll take obscure uses for a thousand. Jason, any other things you want to think about? We should we should be thinking about for two thousand nine. Uh, Intel's Larrabee might make it to market. They've always said late two thousand nine or maybe early twenty ten. So mm -hmm. we don't know, and we don't know a whole lot about it. We know it's this <laughs> weird architecture that does all. It's it's a bunch of CPU like cores, Pentium like cores. But it's not a cell processor. But it's not a cell <laughs> processor, and it's x eighty six compatible, and they're doing the whole rendering pipeline in. Software. It's going to support DirectX and all those things, but we don't know if it's going to be fast. We don't know all this stuff. Is it, I'm still trying to figure out if that's supposed to be competing with, you know, ATI and NVIDIA, or if it's competing with like Intel and ATI, or is it Intel and AMD? I mean, is, yeah, it, a, is it a processor? Is it a GPU? Is it a, you know? Well, the, the writing on the wall is that all of these really CPU intensive tasks, like transcoding video and stuff, are best served by. GP, GPU stuff on graphics right. cards. So Intel's making a product that'll do that. And the first product of Larrabee, they keep saying, is going to be a high-end enthusiast graphics card. So figure a $300 or more graphics card is where that's going to first show up. Down the line, you know, maybe it'll be a second processor on your motherboard again, you know, just, just like the old math coprocessor days. I was going to say, I feel so 486 all of a sudden. But like that, you know, you want to do your video conversion really <laughs> fast or folding it home or whatever it is. Everything old is new again. Jason, it's sort of like that. Yeah. So awesome to have you on again. Thank you so no much. No problem. We'd like to thank Jason again for stopping by and helping us out on the show. If you want to catch up on more of Jason's work, just surf on over to extremetech.com. It's the place to go if you're serious about PC performance. And now a message from one of our sponsors, the National Campaign Against Drunk Driving. Impaired driving continues to be a social scourge that kills and maims thousands of Americans every year. In 2006, 13,470 people were killed in alcohol-impaired driving crashes. These fatalities accounted for 32% of the total motor vehicle traffic fatalities in the United States. 15% of all drivers involved in fatal crashes during the week were alcohol-impaired, compared to 31% on weekends. And it's preventable. If you're planning to drink alcohol with friends, designate a sober driver before going out and give that person your keys. And if you're impaired, use mass transit, call a taxi, or a sober friend or family member. Or you can use your community sober rides program. So do the smart thing. Don't drink and drive. Ever since we asked you if you wanted to see us build a DIY photo studio, quite a few of you wrote in, like Giles, who said, I would love to see what Veronica Belmont mentioned in your latest Techzilla episode. I have a spare part of my house that could be transformed. If it's possible, I'd enjoy watching the photography studio be built. Thank you, Giles. Um, you know what? It's really, we weren't thinking big photo studio. No. No, we were no. thinking like little photo like studio. Totally DIY too, not like welcome to the new room in your apartment, which is your giant photo no. studio. No, thing, it's like a little box. The thing is box. though, what we're doing here can definitely be scaled up to a larger yes. room. It's more of, it's an idea. It's a way that things work that make for good photos and uh, you can do it on a small scale or you can do it on a large scale. Yeah, Pretty much all you need is a square box, <laughs> like this one here, some tissue paper tape, mm -hmm. and, a, uh, and a knife, da da da. Oh, and lights too. Lights help also. Yeah. And we'd have built this weeks ago, but we couldn't resist waiting around for some tissue paper and poster board we could scrounge. Why? Because we love the recycling and that makes the cost of this project just about free. But basically, mm -hmm. what you need is like some tissue paper or some thin nylon fabric. Right. And that's mainly to diffuse the light source, right? So you get a nice balanced light well, on the object like that you're shooting. You just shooting. want this nice, lovely light because you want to kill off shadows. Now, if you're looking through the camera right now, you notice there are a metric ton of shadows in there because we have giant thousand watts lights in here and try though I might my little 100 watt <laughs> lamp cannot Can't compete, compete. No. 
We've used big igloo coolers, white nylon laundry baskets, and a lot of other weird things to diffuse light and get that oh so pleasant nifty look. But the Strobist blog really nailed this into an easy to replicate project. It's the How To DIY $10 Macro Photo Studio. <laughs> and you're looking at it right here. Box, tissue paper, poster board, tape, and a box cutter or scissors sharp thing, and a light of some kind or several lights. Because basically you can do up to three lights on this. You can cover any of these up if you want to control the light. You leave the box, basically the bottom of the box is cut out. I've got the little sort of infinity panel in the back, which makes right, it right. really great for taking pictures of stuff if you want to look like there's no background there. And it's really simple. Tape up the bottom, cut off the top and bottom flaps of the top, cut holes in the left, right, top, and bottom, tape down tissue paper on the left, right, and top, and tape poster board to the back for the infinity sweep effect, which is really common with people doing green screens and right. stuff like that. You know, I've seen ones too where they've used actual like PVC pipes mm -hmm. and built a more permanent method that'll yeah. probably stand around for quite a long time. So you can do this <laughs> version that will last you for as long as you want it to or as long as you need it to. Or as if long you as leave you it near the garage door it. when it starts raining like I did this weekend. This is the second me? one really? I built. Really? Oh, that's yeah. hilarious. I had no idea. <laughs> tissue that's really paper funny. plus rain equals the suck. But yeah, you can do a very similar project with like PVC pipes and uh, actual white fabric mm -hmm. that will do much of the same thing that the um, tissue paper here. It'll be more of a light tent. Yes. And also a somewhat tent of more sorts. permanent. Um, you can light it with a strobe, sunlight, house lamp, halogen lights from Home Depot. Mm -hmm. Just tune your camera for the kind of light you're using. Folks using basically the reason you cut the bottom out is so you can like drop it over a cactus. I'm notorious for cactus photography out in the desert. I didn't know that. Yeah, you want to freak out a bunch of guys who are like manly men in the desert, like start taking picture of little tiny cactus flowers. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm like picture of a cactus. Getting in Why? touch with my feminine side, my artsy side. My artsy side. I needed to balance the yin and the yang here out in the desert. <laughs> it's right? 800 horse power and little tiny and desert flowers. flowers. <laughs> Anyhow, we got some pictures to show you the after of what our lighting sort of looked like with the box, without the box. If you think it's worth your time, you know what? This took us a whopping nine minutes to build. Chances are you can build something even better in eight minutes because you probably know how to use scissors. Absolutely. Well, I think we have time for one more question today and the last one comes from George who's looking to be the life of the party this holiday season. Hey, Pat and Veronica, I saw this iPod mixer at Urban Outfitters. Oh, you trendy shopper, you. Well, I was doing Christmas shopping and was wondering if it was any good, because if it is, I want to get one to play with in my dorm. Also, if you have a better idea of how I can do this for cheaper, that would be good. Thank you, George. Ah, Urban Outfitters, uh, one of my favorite places to shop, where I can guarantee that I'll see three girls in the same shirt as me that week. But anyhow, <laughs> no, really. It's true. Happens all the time. I remember being young and shopping there when they still There's had clothes that There's not that many options, me. but I digress. They're uh, stylish. Thank you. That uh, particular dock is made by Sergio USA, and it's called the iSpin. Uh, it has built-in reverb, high-low pass filters, flange, and even some scratching sounds, so you can sound like you're actually spinning those records. I haven't used one personally, so I can't vouch for the quality of that particular DJ set. But there are other options out there, too, if you're interested in shopping around a little bit. My personal favorite is the Newmark iDJ iPod DJ Mixer. It's got EQ settings and a quarter-inch mic input, Ooh. plus it fits perfectly on an actual turntable. So if that's something that you do regularly, you can just kind of add that to your whole mix. That's funny. So, you know, it fits in with all your other gear. You can find it online for about $150. Um, some other choices include the Gemini iTrax BLK iPod DJ and the Ion iPod DJ Mixing Station, both of which are under $120. If you really want to DJ it up, and I'm talking like <laughs> hardcore, this thing is awesome. A little more expensive though. The Newmark iDJ2 iPod mixer with scratch control has these Vicka, little Vicka, scratch Vicka. pads so you can go wicka wicka wicka. I prefer the wicka. Wicka oh, wicka wicka wicka. Sorry. Wee, wicka 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 wicka. With the best of them. No vinyl required. I sound like a pro, right? You sounded like... Total pro. Oh my goodness. Exactly. Uh, that one, however, <laughs> is going to cost you around between $400 and $600. It's a little more pricey. So that's a little more pricey. So, But hey, if you're planning on you know, spinning at local bars and such to make up for the price differential, well, there you go. <laughs> or a little something something on the side. But those are kind of the options out there. There's a few good ones. Uh, but if you want to go listen to that one, just bring your iPod to Urban Outfitters and pop it in and see how it sounds. Good They'll probably plan. let you. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Ask nicely. Ask nicely. Don't Offer to buy it. somebody a t-shirt. For all of you watching, we live in your questions, so email us at revision 3com Tech out product reviews, how-tos, you ask us, we'll do it. But we need those emails, so don't be shy. Send them into at revision 3com Or 
or even better, send us a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your shiny happy mug on our show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us a link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can visit our forums at revision3.com slash forum. We have a grand old time in there. It's a party. Grand old time. It's wonderful. <laughs> and hey, the Revision 3 store is up and running. If you want to pick up some last minute gift items for someone or even just for yourself, head on over to revision3.com slash store. You'll find t-shirts and hats from your favorite shows, plus if Roger gets his way, hot sauce. Oh, that'd be so <laughs> awesome. I can't wait. You guys got to put on the pressure with Louderback for that one. Revision3.com slash store. Send them an email. They got so, some spiffy t-shirts there. They do. Like I had my Texola one on last week. That mm -hmm. was red. Rad. 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 We should get our tees in the store too. That's our a wicked good looking t-shirt. Are you making fun of me? Not even a little bit. One more thing before we go. We did a live stream last week and one of our viewers was unable to catch it because he was too busy recording himself playing our ending theme music on his Baldwin piano, <laughs> which is way stylish. It's so awesome that we're going to run it at the end of this very show. So, Piano Player 88 Key, great job. Thank you. Sorry you missed it. And thank you very much for re-recording our theme. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Till next time, you've been watching. I just don't know what to do anymore. I ran out of things. You're a naughty girl. This is creepy. Creepy! You like how my naughty girl is very similar to my zombie hunter attack from I last week? I wasn't going to it up. <laughs> <laughs> what were you talking about hitting on boys? That's how I attack my men. <laughs> they rip their throats out. It's really sexy. <laughs> I hope the camera was rolling <laughs> off that. Hmm. That was pretty clever. I picked drinking. Not classy. Not classy at all. Fire up them Velveeta sandwiches. Veronica's drinking beer from a straw. You can make a sandwich out of Velveeta? You never had Velveeta sandwiches? No. Obviously, I can't say it because the camera's rolling. Josh, are you in the bathroom? If you're shopping HCTV, go back to next week and watch this. It is mandatory viewing. We also took the opportunity. Should we keep this all on the two, or should we have this? <laughs> it's kind of weird. <laughs> you, you're getting that thing around you. You're like, because I, and I was mouthing things as you were doing it too, so that was probably awkward. <laughs> energy, not speed. In energy, three, not speed. two, energy. energies. Energy, energy. Oh, energy. Ho, ho. energy. I energy. see. And we also took the opportunity to ask Roger what he felt were the big trends to look out for in 2009. You said Roger. I said Roger? Yeah. <laughs> wow, Freudian slip. I've got Roger on my mind. Hi, Roger. Roger on my mind. Woo woo. Oh. Roger in. is so sexy. He's always on Patrick's mind. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, honey. Where's little sad face McGee over here? What's he doing? What's he doing down there? Stats. What's he doing down there? He's all sad on the floor. What's he doing? Oh, he's mad. Patrick. Shut up, Roger. <laughs>